This show is brought to you by Datsusara. Go to DS Gear and check out their extremely high quality functional gear that's made with hemp textiles. They have bags, geese, rash guards, and more. They have t-shirts. They have fanny packs. Go to dsgear.com and use code word Joey to save 5%. And the show is also brought to you by onnit.com. Go to onnit.com and use code word church to save 10% on all of their optimization products like Strongbone, Alpha Brain, New Mood, Shroom Tech Immune, and Shroom Tech Sport. It's code word church at onnit.com to save 10%. Oh shit. Drop it, Lee. Kick that fucking mule, Lee. Oh. Wednesday. August 10th, cocksuckers. What? Oh shit. Lee Syatt. Susanna Lee. She'll be coming in a little later. And your uncle fucking Joey on a Wednesday night. What else are you going to be doing? What? What? Kick it, Lee. Oh, shit. Out of that nutsack. It's your fucking lucky night right here, cocksuckers. What? Oh shit, do I think you're a nasty girl, I love it, you filthy animal you. Give me those dirty feet, and those stinky ankles, oh yeah. What up you bad motherfuckers, Wednesday night. DJ Lee, cut the fucking music, what are you, gonna you over there like uh, turning it off like somebody's gonna jump off a cliff, you know, ain't nobody jumping off a fucking cliff here. <laughs> What's going on my little brother? I'm having a good day man, fuck that weed is good. It's a good night. Fuck yeah. It's Wednesday night. Everything's crack a lacking. We're back on, you know. I feel a lot better. I was a little under the weather there. I ha I can't smoke pot with a lot of people. I get sick. And right away, like that night when I left here, just hitting that vapor pen with the kid from Eureka. Yeah, you just knew? I just knew. When I went home that wow. night, I got up at 4 in the morning. My throat was already scratchy. By the time I got up at fucking uh, 7, I was spitting colors and shit. You know, I, three I hate days. I you know you're going to be sick. Yeah, you know, like, and, and here's the problem when you're sick, that you go, you know what, I got this, and you go do something stupid, and you break the sweat, and you leave the t-shirt on, and here you are for six weeks coughing. You know those two-week coughs, and you finally go to the doctor, oh, and he gives you a prescription, them, yeah. and this is why you have to really watch, especially at my age, especially, you know, and I'm thinking about how I got sick two weeks after the surgery, because those antibiotics clean out your fucking system. So your immune system is weak. It's building back up. I got back on a plane. I got sick on a plane. You know, this is the shit that happens. Just getting some. This is just a simple cold. But you can't do much with it. You know for a fact that if you fucking juggernaut this thing, it could either get really bad or it could shake. Why take the chance? I got to go to Denver this week. I got to do five fucking shows. Thursday sold out already. Well, well, why do I take a chance? I just relaxed. I did not go to jujitsu all week be between the fucking arm. And the cold and the whole fucking deal, I just said, you know what, again, just relax. Why kill yourself? I don't want to turn this into a pneumonia, and then I got on the fucking plane, it gets worse, and I go up in high altitude, and then we got a fucking problem all weekend. And not to mention, like, rolling, it's like the same as smoking with someone. If you roll with someone, they get up, and then they're sneezing, they have a cold. I'm like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, You're sweating so, on me. So what I do is just then tend to myself. I did a little writing. I made some notes. You know, shit like that. It wasn't the biggest week of my life. I got to move. So I already started throwing some shit out, some t-shirts, shit I don't wear, shit I found that I didn't even know I still had, shoes, just, I'm doing the first sweep. The next week I'm doing the most intense sweep when I get home, then I go to out, oddball, and then when I come back we make the move. You gotta give me the mover's number so we get them on fucking point. Oh yeah. The bed's coming from Helix Sleep, they nice. sent us a bed, the whole fucking deal, so it's over. It's, uh... It can be really stressful moving. It could be if you let it be. If you put yourself in the predicament of a two-dayer, and then you want to cut corners and borrow a truck from your friend, and then your other buddy's going to come, that's a mind fuck right there. So what I've done the last two times is I start moving boxes over on the 15th. They did the lawn today, tomorrow's the painting, and I guess next week is the carpeting, and right after that I start moving over there. Three boxes a night. When I leave here after the podcast, three boxes a night. 
I'm not doing nothing at two thirty in the afternoon. Three boxes, three boxes, three boxes, three boxes, three boxes. And pretty lo pretty soon when the movers come, it's a fucking it's three hours because we're right around the fucking corner. Yeah, the only it's tough. what are we taking? We're donating the couches. They smell like cat piss. <laughs> We're taking the TV, the fucking bedroom, the kids' room. That's it. We can't carry the refrigerator down because it might break the fucking stairs. And we can't take the oven. So what, what are we taking? The pictures, the bathroom shit. That's it. The clothes and the cabinets. That's it. So I could start taking the winter clothes over there already. Suits, shirts, you know, and that's how you do it. The books I got in that library stuck going over there. Let the movers move the two desks, the mattresses, the bedroom, the baby's bedroom. That's it. Boxes, we're going to take dishes over. The dish, like, she's already got all that packed, the shit that's not, we don't use on a daily. Get that shit out of here. Get it out. So that shit's going. She already cleaned the cabinets for groceries, like the shit that's expired or we don't really use. We travel light. Us Puerto Ricans travel light, cocksucker. Dude, I used to, I, I've moved bottles oh, of please. alcohol like i pack i don't throw anything away i can't i can't throw away I, I i literally have a box that i bring that i take the stuff from my fridge i'm like all right we're gonna no, move i take the shit from my fridge okay I, I, but there's shit that like tartar sauce I'll you know it, yeah. there's tartar <laughs> sauce that's half full and the sides are crusted what are you gonna take that for take get salt. Yep. no uh what's the red shit what's ketchup the, no the other shit cocktail sauce yeah that shit gets all crusty. Throw it away. It's a dollar forty nine on special. <laughs> you can make it at your fucking house. I'm gonna carry that shit with me that it falls, and you got it on your fingers, and you touch your sweater, and you got that red shit on your finger. There's a thousand things that don't need to really go. No, I don't know. It's not worth the fucking aggravation. It's it like because you you're getting a house, so it's cool that you get to move in early. I've always ever since I moved. No, no, out, we're gonna move boxes early, right? But we don't move till like September first is complete. Oh yeah, no, no, I understand. But what I'm saying is like. Ever since I moved out, I've lived in apartments. And with that, you only have like a day. So I never, as broke as I was, I never once asked friends to help me move. I've always paid. Because it just, we, we, we were talking before the podcast started about how like you start realizing how much stuff costs. Like if you're on vacation or something. I was thinking about that the other, like last night. I, I bought something and I was like, that's like half an hour of work or whatever when you start realizing how much time it takes to actually buy something that you're buying you, like you'll start you either start buying less or you'll realize that your time's important so rather than spending four days moving just hire movers for 300 bucks I feel the same way I feel, if you think I want to go up and downstairs in the morning with fucking couches and shit I can't handle that not three days of that no it's not worth my health. It's not nothing, especially for what we're moving. Like I said to you, we got fucking Salvation <laughs> Army on point. They're picking up the couches, the chairs. We're taking the two TVs, the baby's TV, shit like that. The baby's room is the toughest, believe it or not. She's the most tough? Yeah, but we're taking all her clothes over and boxes over. The moving thing is preparation. It's like painting a room. <clears throat> you come in here, look at a room, look at it, look at it, look at it, and then just put a fucking roller on it, roll the wall, and then later on have to get turpentine and clean off the window sills and clean off the fucking electrical cabinets because of not. You see how that gray and that white look? Yeah. You see how good it looks? How many times have you gone to somebody's house and there's paint on that white fucking cap? Oh, yeah, yeah. On the electrical thing. So what do you do? You look at the room and you go, okay, let me tape it off first. And that saves me time later with turpentine. God forbid you knock over the turpentine on the carpet. Now you fucking go and the turpentine drips off the rag because you put. now it goes on the new paint. Who needs that shit? That's the fucking old way of doing it. Just go in there. You have to look at things and look at them and look at them again and go, okay, this is, how, this is the plan for this. Look at what you're working with, what you you know, if you're working, what your work dates are, what you have available to you. I mean, there's a lot of fucking alternatives. And, you know, you're moving. You have a first, last, security. You're already tapped out. But there's different ways to do it to save on an angle, you know. I don't know anything about cross-country moving. I've never done that. I heard that's a fucking nightmare. I heard that's a fucking nightmare. That people come, then they they want you to give them 5000 bucks for the furniture. They hold a ransom. I've heard horror shows about that shit. I know about moving from point A to point B. From point A to point B, long distances, it's just clothing. I've just always taken clothing. That's it. A toothbrush, some socks, 
some shampoo, and you're ready to go. Some Q-tips, and who's going to stop you? All that other shit, I don't know nothing about. But in the short distances, that's when you have to move your fucking furniture. Have you ever driven like a U-Haul? I think I would destroy, like the city would come to a halt if I had a U-Haul. I've like driven a U-Haul, but short distances. I, I, Not cross country, you know, maybe, I think the most, when we moved from Seattle, we took uh, a fucking camper with a trailer, with a car on the fucking trailer. You had three vehicles? Yeah. In a was, <laughs> like fucking the Sheik of Araby. You know what that's like? You know what that's like? I don't like none of that shit. That shit scares me to fucking pieces. That must have been. So it was you and Carol. And a dog. And a dog. And a camper trailing a trailer with a car off of that. Oh, my God. You have no fucking idea. And then we pull over <laughs> in San Francisco. I'm standing on the street. She goes to make She parks the car. We park the car. She goes to turn the U-turn with just the trailer. And all of a sudden, you see the back wheels fall off. And you see the trailer fall on the back. And you see the back wheels just stuck there with the hitch on it and shit. So we gotta, got, had to get a tow truck to, to tow it into a fucked up neighborhood and park it overnight. We had to sleep in it. People were having an open mic outside our fucking door. This was the craziest week of my life, sleeping on the street in that fucking trailer in San Francisco with a fucking dog. And people outside your trailer singing with guitars and shit. And, shooting heroin and you're like what the fuck is this shit oh my god they were talking about shooting heroin to tie him up you know did he have any fucking uh, cotton balls I mean it was crazy and I'm laying there in that bed going what the fuck have I done to deserve this shit so I know I hate that shit that's the stuff I can't tolerate like that was that's what stopped me from moving cross country with my wife the cats if I move cross country with my wife, then I'd have to move the wife, the fucking cats, the kid. You got to stop every two hours with the fucking cats. You have no idea, my friend. Yeah, that sounds like a disaster. Yeah, you have no fucking idea what it's like. You break down with cats, those motherfuckers fry in the back seat. S so you got to have all your fucking shit intact, you know. It's uh, it's tough. It's fucking tough. But like I said to you, I'm... I'm handling this the right way. I'm looking at I'm going to Denver. I come back, and that's when I start making my moves. We're keeping in touch with the fucking property manager every day, back and forth, letting us know what the schedule is. So once we could start, it's three little boxes every day. Next week, I throw every shit out in the house. Next Monday night, by Tuesday morning, I take three or four bags that I goodwill up to fucking corn. All oh, right, yeah, you just got to get rid of Everything. Everything. Are you excited for Mercy? Like, it must be... Like, I didn't grow up in an apartment. I grew up... I was very lucky, and I grew up in a house. And the town where I grew up in literally had, I think, maybe one apartment complex. And I never... Now when I see kids, I feel not bad, but I'm like, it must be different growing up in an apartment from a house. Like, Mercy's gonna love that. It's been rough the last three years. Because we didn't really know we were going to have the child when we moved into this place. And then we didn't know whether to move out, rent, own. You know, I like an area because of its convenience. You know, I'm very convenient here. I like this area. You know, I've always liked this area. I lived in this area when I first moved to LA for three or four months. With Carol and Vineland and Moore Park. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like this area. I've always, I know the CVS people, I know the weed stores, I know the sandwich places, I know everybody up here. So I didn't think about moving to West Hills or moving to Vegas. I couldn't even imagine it starting over again. So when my wife said, fuck it, we're not going to find the house. Let's just rent one for a year and kill some time. I was like, give it a go. I didn't think we were going to find one this quick. I really didn't. But it was in the cards. I told my wife this is how it was going to happen. It wasn't going to happen it was going to be a quick process, just like this happened. Come look at it Saturday, fill out the application, and you'll know by Monday. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. I'm very happy. You know, I, I grew up in New York City in an apartment for a few years, but then we moved to a house in New Jersey, and there was a big difference. 
there was a big difference as a child, your confidence and whatnot. I mean, most children don't fucking think about that shit. Well, I don't even mean like most the fact that they're in an apartment. Yeah. I just mean like you have a little a yard. It's a yard. You can be a little loud. I have a friend that has three kids and they live in a one bedroom apartment. Jeez. He's fighting for his life and she's fighting for her fucking life. But who could come over? They sleep in the living room. They just have beds everywhere in the living room. Yeah. Nice people. I visit them like twice a year. I know them. I bring the kids gifts. I talk to them and shit all the time on the phone. She used to cut my hair, my wife's hair, but they got three kids in the one bedroom apartment. So I know how fortunate I am. I know how fortunate I am, you know. It was a blessing in the skies when they asked us to leave down there. They one day just knocked on the door and said, the landlord found out you had cats, you have to go. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's the story. Terry lived in, I lived in there with Terry for eight fucking years. Oh, the first place in Hollywood. The first place in Hollywood. And one day, the day after we got married, they knocked on the door and said, you got to move out. And we were like, are you fucking serious? And they're like, yeah, you have cats. It's not in the lease. Terry's been here nine years with the fucking cats. What are you talking about? But what they were trying to do is get the, it was rent controlled apartments. Right. They were trying to get everybody out, redo the apartments, and then charge $1,500 a month. <laughs> Absolutely. And at first I was mad, but then it's everything else that's been in my life. They did me a fucking favor. They did me a fucking favor. You know, and I didn't even know it. I was so stressed when I moved up here. I mean, the rent was going up $800. I thought it was the end of the fucking world. I never thought I would make the rent up here. I never thought I would make the rent up here. I always thought we I barely made rent down there. How am I going to make fucking the rent up here? And it worked itself out, Lee, because everything does. You know, I was thinking about the process today, the process that everybody's scared of. You know, there's a process in life. And we try to rush it at times, but you can't rush it. It's a fucking process. And I know it from a comedian standpoint because when I first got here, myself, Josh Wolf. Brody, uh, you know, we were very eager. You're very eager. You're very eager. You're very eager. And then you start losing it. And then a situation happens that puts you back into perspective. And then you know how to handle this place. There's three stages to this town, this city up here. And that's what usually happens. You're very eager. You're very eager. You're very eager. You start doing things. You start making little moves. And then you book something, but you see a little bit behind the curtain and it wasn't what you thought it was going to be and the people turned and everything changed and you're bummed for a while. But when you recover from that, you're a different person in this town. It's tough when I see like uh, Tony Hinchcliffe is on fire right now and he's frustrated, he's eager, but he doesn't know that it's a process and I can't explain it to him. Do you know what I'm saying? It's very rough because if somebody would have came to me in 2003 and told me it was a process, I would have told them to go fuck themselves. There ain't no process here. I'm cracking jokes. People are laughing. What's the fucking problem? It's, it doesn't work that way. It works in layers, but we're always scared of the fucking process. Tomorrow you walk into a union hall and you go, I want to be a fucking union plumber. And they say, okay, it takes four years of being an apprentice two years residential, two years commercial, and then you join the master's program. I don't know the dynamics. I'm just making up numbers here. Like I've always said, we look at that number and we look at it as so distant. But then once you do it, you know, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I, I completely understand. But this is something that I've been struggling with lately. So you said there's a process, right? What I'm most worried about now is making the wrong move. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm worried about, like I've, I have a couple different options, and like, like, let's say someone gets two job offers. Whenever that happened to me, I'd always be like, fuck, which one do I take? Like, I'm all, In my mind, if I take the wrong one, my life is going to end. And I know probably that's not going to happen, but that's a big fear of mine, is which decision to make. I think the biggest mistake we make is going to people who don't know your situation. Uh -huh. And you break your situation down to them, your job, what the benefits are, what the, the cons are. You know, there's all that shit, right? And right. then... But at the end, and I've said this for years, I thought about this maybe when we still live down there, how you always know the best decisions for you. It's just 
scared coming up with the decision. You know, you're in a room, you lost your job, your wife's not talking to you, she moved back in with her mother, this is all because of drugs and you're gambling. The last thing in your mind at that point is going to a rehab and ending this party. You know, it's the most distant thing from your fucking mind. You're trying to figure out how to fix it? But while you're trying to sit there and fix everything, you know this is going to be the first answer. This is going to calm everybody down by you going to a rehab. Even if you don't want to go, the people around you feel at ease. You may have a good chance of getting your wife back. I never thought of going to a rehab. That's why I never went to a fucking rehab. Like, I never thought of going to a fucking rehab. I couldn't imagine ending this fucking party, this charade. So, you, like, you just mean you didn't consider it? You probably had the idea. I had ideas about it. We all do. When we're in that position, we all know that this is, we need help. This is uncontrollable. I told myself I wasn't going to get high till Friday. Mm-hmm. It's fucking Tuesday. I'm bleeding from my nose. There's a dead chick in my bed. I'm not going to work again. You know, it, just little things. And you say to yourself, what ends this? And you're like a fucking rehab. But, you know, you know that's the answer. But you're like, nah, there's got to be something else I can do. Oh, absolutely. But here's the, the frustrating part for me. So, like, that's a negative thing happening. What happens when things are going great and you have to make a decision? I'm worried that when things are going good... You know why make... things are going great? Why? Because you made the right decisions. So just believe in yourself and go with your fucking stomach. <sighs> things are going great because you made the right decisions. Because you made certain decisions at certain times. You know, I'm not here. I'm not going to Denver this week to headline because I'm a funny comedian. I'm not even going to headline. I'm not even going to Denver because of all the work I've put into this. Comically, I mean, like riding and getting on stage at night and waiting in line. That's all great and dandy. How you get forward is those little sacrifices when you stick to them. Sacrifices are the fucking thing. I never realized it till. I started thinking about this Jody situation and what she was mad about years ago when a group of people were all so angry at me that I don't do enough social activities. And they're mad at you for that? A lot of people get mad at me because I don't do a lot of things socially because they don't get it that when you're doing some, some something socially that, you know, they always want to do things on nights where it's comedy nights. Like Monday nights. Monday nights was the hottest night in L.A. 10 years ago. You know, to have the the honor to get on stage at the Laugh Factory or the Improv or the store on a Monday night was fucking great, Lee, you know? They always had parties on Monday nights or Thursday nights or Friday nights or Saturday nights. Those are the nights you're doing comedy. You know, like what, my birthday is June whatever. You're in Ohio that weekend. They would look at you like, why don't you cancel it? Move the date. This is going to be a great party. And you're like, are you fucking kidding me? It's the little things I stuck to. It wasn't the time I put in or because I'm funnier than Lisa yet. It was the little things I stuck to. Like, these are the things I'm not doing, you know, and these are the things I'm doing. Granted, it took me a long time to stop doing fucking blow. But once I stopped, I stopped. And I used those other principles that I've used in other things where you sacrifice things. You go, this is not what I'm doing. This is what I'm going to do. Even if I want to do this really bad, this is what needs to be done. Right, absolutely. And it's always panned out for me. I've been thinking a lot about that lately, how that always worked out for me, and people never understood that part of me. Well, Like, when I tell you I'm going to do something from 2 to 5, that's what I'm doing. I don't give a fuck what you got going on. I already got something going on. I'm happy that you got something going on. I'm going to do my thing, you do your thing, and I'll call you at 10 after 5. But people don't seem to understand that. Shane came to the show the other night. Mm-hmm. Remember Shane? Tuesday night he came. Last night yeah, yeah. he came. We were talking the other day. And I go, you working? And he goes, I'm working. Usually I wouldn't answer the phone. And I started talking to him. Like people like him, Mitch Hedberg, all those guys had schedules where they wouldn't respond to people. They would just lock themselves in the room and focus on writing. You know, that's very hard to do with the fucking internet. That's why I like to go to a coffee shop when I write. Because I hate the internet around. When I go right, I shut the phone off and I put it in a bag. And I don't give a fuck who calls. 
I'll look at it every fucking 30 minutes or something like that in my mind, but I won't look at Twitter or Facebook. It's just a, for calls, you know? Right, absolutely. I took the Facebook off the phone. You know, I'm taking all that shit off the phone anyway. You see the article today about Ari Shafir? Yeah, I read it, yeah. You know, it makes a lot of sense. I, I think it totally makes sense. It makes sense. I didn't understand. For people who didn't read it, it was about Ari giving up his cell phone, and they, they interviewed this, like... Smartphone. Yeah, his smartphone, smartphone. you're right. Uh, and they they interviewed this, like, professor who was like... I don't think he. I don't think it's right. I don't think uh, there people do have an addiction to the to, to the smartphone. I absolutely. I get a little bit nervous if I feel like I lost my phone or I don't have it with me. I like. I would get a lot more done if I didn't have one. Absolutely, a hundred percent. I've really been thinking about it. Yeah. This thing is broken. You know, it's still stuck on two fucking messages. I use the calculator once in a while. I use the notes once in a while. I like the voice recording. Uh, you taught me how to use it, even though I erased the show by mistake. I don't know what I'm fucking doing. I don't like Twitter on it. I took the fucking Facebook off it. I got the emergency email on it, just in case I have an audition or something like that. But besides that, there's nothing on me to really distract me, distract me. I don't play games. I don't do Pokemon. I don't read fucking comic books. You know, I have music on here. But it doesn't sound as good as the iPod. And I don't want to have not have power when I'm on the phone, when I'm on the fucking plane. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, So yeah. if you get on a four-hour flight, you get off, your power is fucking dead on these things. Now you got to stand there like a mortadelle and charge your fucking phone. As soon as I get on the plane, I shut the fucking phone off and I put the uh, the iPod on. Yeah. You know, and I do that, so I always have my phone in full charge. What if the plane goes down and you're on a fucking island in Baruba? And nobody could call because I mean, they've been playing fucking Pokemon. Here, my shit's going to be full up, Jack. No, it's important. It's important. And it's like it's I find myself going back through Facebook that I've already seen. Like it's 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 crazy what a time suck it is. Well, boredom. Boredom is a fucking thing. And you run home, you open it up. You see if somebody messaged you on Facebook. You see if somebody messaged you on Twitter. You see if somebody got on Hotmail, and I shut the thing off and leave. I do that ten times a fucking day. Just to see if somebody had needed something or something. That's what I do. But besides that, I'm not on there. When I go on the weekends, on the road, that computer I have doesn't let me really do much. It's such a fucking nightmare, that surface. It's such a fucking nightmare. And that's when everybody wants to email me, and everybody wants to talk on the fucking computer. And it, You know, I find shit on that computer when I go on the road that I don't see on the house computer. Really? Yeah, it's fucking crazy. That's weird. And going back to not answering the phone, I have a problem now because people know that I'm not at an office during the day. I get fucking a thousand calls that have nothing to do with about business. And I feel like if it's a family member or something, I feel like I have to take it. And I look back and it's an hour out of my day. Like between two or three phone calls. Like, do you not answer phone calls? If I sh you taught me how to sh do that phone shut off. So there's days I put that on, I forget to turn it back on, <laughs> so the fucking phone don't ring, and all of a sudden 35 people fucking call me. But again, I'm like you. I look at it, and I go, I was with my daughter. I couldn't answer the phone anyway, so I'm happy I had this thing off. Yeah, do not disturb, yeah? Yeah, the do not disturb thing. You know, that, that that's it. There's times I forget to turn it on at night, and it runs the next fucking day. And then I go, fuck, nobody's called. <laughs> <laughs> And I go, holy shit, because I don't even look at it. When I get up in the morning, I don't even look at the phone anymore. I don't turn the TV on. I don't look at the phone no more. Nobody calls me up to 12 no more. I don't do drugs. I don't do drugs. Every once in a while, Ralphie calls me early, and I'll call him back, or I'll call him when I get in the car or something. But besides that, nobody calls me overnight no more. I think that's the move, because I'm, I'm this way, and I think a lot of people in, the, in their 20s are this way. In my bed, if Paul is not there... My cell phone and my laptop are next to me, like in the other person's spot. It's, uh, like that can't be good. Well, you see how much time you're wasting. You see, and listen, man, I freak out when I go for my phone. I'm a Cuban Jew. I'm thinking 400. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm thinking 400 and all my numbers. I got to start from fucking scratch now. That's what you start thinking about. 400 and all the numbers you lost. That's all I give a fuck about. I got to start from scratch now. I got a thousand fucking numbers on there that I've developed over the years. That's what I worry about. You go to your hotel and call. How many times? That's why before I get out of the cab, I look everywhere. When I get in a person's car, I look everywhere. Sometimes I take my phone out and put it in the door. 
Oh, no. Yeah, and I get out of the car. You have no fucking idea what I've gone through sometimes. So now I hold on to this thing. I could have taken this thing in a fucking year ago. I just keep them. I don't even know what it is. A five, a three, a two, a fucking six. I don't know, and I don't give a fuck. It's got 16 cracks in the fucking screen. I'm going to have to take it in eventually. I don't remember if it was in the Ari Shafir article or something else that I read today. It was probably the Ari article. But it said something like there's more smartphones in Great Britain than there are people. And I was thinking about that. I was like, how can that be? And what it is is, what I think it is, is they somehow tricked us into buying a new phone every two years. They just, they're like, okay, you you have a two-year plan, so every two years you buy a phone. And there's really no reason to. But, like, I, I must have four phones at my house just doing nothing. Why don't you donate them to the Army? The Army needs old cell phones? Yeah, they refix them. Somebody was telling me, yeah, you can donate them to the service. Okay, I know I do. Yeah, you can go online and they give you an address and you can mail it to them. And some soldier in Iraq could have a fucking phone. You ever think of that? No, I hadn't. See? It's amazing the amount of money we spend on that stuff, though. Oh, no. And, and listen, these things break. They're, they're programmed to break. They're programmed to break every 18 fucking months. There's a thing. You go in there and you take the chip out. Is that true? Have you heard about that? No, I haven't heard about it. I've There's heard... something on a computer, I think. There's a chip. Oh, it's like in... a self-destruct chip? Yeah. I don't doubt it. You go in it. there and you take it out and now the computer lasts long. I don't know if this is true. I heard this from somebody. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt anything that these people are doing. Because like yeah, it... I don't want to buy a fucking phone. I don't want to put that much stock into a phone. Like, I was raised to stay the fuck away from the phone. I didn't start talking to people on the phone until I talked to girls when you're 13. Right, yeah. And you talk to them for hours. I don't give a fuck about that. But to sit there, all fuck, I can't do it no more. I have to write. I have to pick up the baby. You know, nine out of ten times I'm in front of people. I can't pick up a phone. That doesn't stop a lot of people now, though. Yeah, because they're fucking rude. But if I'm in a meeting with Shane and one of those dudes, I can't pick up a fucking phone. Unless my wife calls me twice, I don't pick up the fucking phone. It yeah. means it's an emergency. That's it. But then, like, I it, like I was thinking about it. I feel bad for people who, like, I, like, when I had a job job, I'd be answering emails, calls, and stuff 24 hours a day, seven days. Like, you must get work emails. And it's different because you don't really have a set schedule. But at a certain point, that's that should stop. Like, you're supposed to have some downtime. Well, let's say I'm out and about, and I get work emails. A lot of work emails entail dates. I can't give them an answer until I get back home if I'm on the road. Right. I don't bring my book with me on the road. I don't know where I'm going to be that fucking day. I have an idea, roughly. I have an idea, but I never want to put myself in a bad position because I have. No. Oh, yeah. I get home, and all of a sudden, I'm like, fuck, I got that thing at fucking 6 o'clock. Now I got to call this guy back and tell him no. So now I have a rule. I've had a rule for a few years that before I give you a fucking date, I gotta go home and check it out. Well, I mean that that that's a good rule. But I mean, I mean, even like at dinner with Mercy, you must get a call about work or an email, and at a certain like at a certain point, you have to like I said, throw it man, away. If it's not a Jew from Beverly Hills, that phone ain't getting fucking picked up. If I'm with Mercy, plain and fucking simple. Plain and fucking simple. If I'm with Mercy, I'm at a table with my wife, and it's a Jew from Beverly Hills, the phone gets picked up. But if it's not a Jew from Beverly Hills, you're in no danger of fucking <laughs> getting picked up, though. I just imagine you having a group on your phone, just the Jews from Beverly Hills. That's it. If you're not a Jew from Beverly Hills, I don't even think about it. I'm with my fucking daughter and with my family. What, what the fuck, you know? What the fuck? And people won't under, some people don't understand that. Like if you don't respond to a text right away or well you don't respond to text at all. But just the phone calls, it's too much. It's too much. It's all fucking day. And then you go home and you get emails on all three you know, I got four fucking six eight different ways of getting an email. I haven't even approved people and I got emails on LinkedIn. <laughs> you understand me? I haven't even fucking signed up for LinkedIn and I don't even know how I got on there and I got a fucking emails on LinkedIn, okay? You have a huge, very popular account. Yeah, like I don't even, I don't want to hang out with business associates and the <laughs> same morons on my Facebook fucking page. The same fucking morons on my Facebook page and the same fucking people on LinkedIn, whatever the fuck it is. So, I, you know, I don't know what the fuck way to go. I got a thousand comics calling me up. Did you know that lately? For what? Just 
a thousand fucking things. I get numbers on my phone. I don't even know. And since I don't have glasses, I can't see them. So if the name's not in there, you're in no fucking danger. I can't see the fucking number. I get 714s, Oshaga, New York. This morning at 8 o'clock, I started getting calls from somebody. I didn't even know. I was outside. I didn't even fucking know until I came up. I got three calls from the same fucking number. No message. You're not getting a call back. You're in no danger. You call till your fingers turn fucking pink. But people know they're not supposed to leave a message with you. No, there's no thing no more. It says not to leave. It says not to leave nothing. It's very ambiguous. There's nothing there that's even me. Nothing. I took all that shit off. Done. No voicemail. No voicemail. If you called me from 10 years ago on that number, you don't know who's got it now. I get people. I wake up sometimes and there's fucking people. Joey, remember me from fucking Click? I don't remember nobody. <laughs> I don't remember nobody. I don't remember nobody. 915. That's El Paso. That's cocaine. I don't remember nobody. Okay? I got no memories. I don't know who the fuck is calling me. I don't know who the hell it is. Hello. All right, I'll be right out, my love. Okay. Bye. Go get the Savage Lee of Death. We got my girl Susanna coming in. She's a, a friend of mine that Felicia introduced me to. Felicia did a documentary that's getting uh, some heat. And it's about... You want to go get it? And it's about... What are you looking at before? It's so mighty. Unfucking believable And it's about... Uh, well, I'll let her tell you, you know, it's uh, they're like... I don't know what the fuck they even call them. I don't know if they're sex workers. I don't know what the fuck to call them. But I did uh, one of the scenes for Felicia, and I found her to be really interesting. And I just thought about it for a long time. Like, uh, how many fucking peep shows I had gone to over the years. You know, I didn't even want to say it. Like, how I met her was a Felicia documentary of her dancing in a peep show. So she was kind of naked, so obviously I'm fucking purple the whole time. She's asking me fucking creepy questions and shit. But after I left and I went home, I wanted to know why in my mind I got all creeped up when I went and did that. I mean, she's just a woman. She's just a beautiful fucking woman. You know, she's a young girl. Whatever the fuck she is, I don't even know how old she is. But why did I get creeped out? So I thought about it. I said, instead of me hitting her up or me going down there and taking her clothes off or something, why don't I get her on the fucking podcast and let's talk about what the fuck she does, how she got into it, why she does it, blah, 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 blah. That's it. You know us, dog. We keep it fucking simple. It's bond hits for Jerry's kids on a fucking Wednesday night in the church. So, yeah, it just seemed an interesting topic for me. You know, as a kid in New York City, what's happening, my love? Let, let Lee go in first, and then you sit in the middle here. Go ahead, Lee. You're a flying fucking savage, brother. Get in here, my little princess of beauty. What's happening? <laughs> Not much. Right as I was leaving, one of my customers was coming in. Oh, oh, Jesus. I'm fucking sorry about that. I like the skirt. It's you. You know what I'm saying? The skirt is you. I like the tats tonight. They're you. Everything's fucking you. What's going on, Lisa? I had everything good. Did you introduce yourself? I did, yes. The edible kicked in as soon as I stood up for a second. <laughs> good, good. They're supposed to kick in when you fucking stand up. What would you like for me to call you on this? Uh, either way, Susanna. Susanna, that's Susanna, what I had you Susanna down Lee, for. Yeah. Susanna Lee. What's going on, beautiful? Um, not much. I'm uh, in the middle of a 15-hour shift, so. <laughs> you know, man, people are killing themselves to live. It's a lot of fucking work. But it you're going to do it. Absolutely. You travel, you go on the road, you do mm -hmm. stand-up, you yeah. fucking sing, you dance, you do burlesque. You do oh, your, no singing. No you're singing. a woman of a thousand fucking things. But I was telling yeah. them, but I met you when I did the documentary for Felicia with you. Mm -hmm. And it was really weird because I've been thinking about you ever since that. Because that night, like, I didn't know what to think when you took your clothes off and stuff. But I kind of froze up, you know. When mm -hmm. I went home, I was like, why did I freeze up like that? And uh, I just wanted to get you on the show and talk about what you do. I really found you interesting and beautiful. So let's bullshit my love what's happening um so this shift tonight where are you working at today uh today i'm working at my main place actually my only place right now it's called Eros St station Eros station okay and it's on oxnard and sepulveda it's a private show place lingerie modeling private dancer that type of thing not like the other place i went to. no there's no glass between me and the customer this is just me alone with a stranger in a small room for 20 30 minutes at a time oh my yeah. fucking god <laughs> 
you have regulars, you said. I do, yeah. Now, how long have you been in this industry? Um, well, when I lived in Chicago in the mid-90s, I did phone sex towards the end of the 90s. And then I quit that. I worked for an independent service, so she didn't have really any... She didn't have any major restrictions on what people could talk about. And uh, she was she was a dog lover, so she, she no bestiality. No bestiality. And I found that out after I got a dog call, and I called her, and I was like, could you please not give me any more animal calls? And she's like, oh, we don't do that. But here's your next customer. He's a Chester. That's what she used to call the, the pedophiles. So I worked for her until I got a really, really bad pedophile, like the, a really terrible call. On and the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I was I was just like, I can't, I can't listen to this anymore. And then uh, I didn't do anything for... Let me think, for several years, for like five years. And then, and in that time I'd been married, I moved from Chicago back to Kansas City, got married, moved out to Oregon, moved back to Kansas City, left my husband, and then I started doing stuff again. But I got into it really, uh, I didn't go straight into sex work. You know, all I had done was phone sex. I hadn't done any in-person stuff. And uh, I met this guy on Craigslist and you know he came up like I met him looking for a guy to to bang. like are there language restrictions on no, no no oh we great don't. so I was looking for a guy to fuck because since I'd left my husband I'd sort of like worn out all the familiar dick that I knew <laughs> so I was looking for a new guy and I went on Craigslist and I was uh talking to this guy his name was James and he shows up in my apartment and when he shows up I see the pictures he sent were just completely inaccurate and I'm like I can't fuck you but we both liked the same drugs and he had some, so we totally hung out, you know, friendly like, and we did for weeks. And then uh, I guess he got tired of hearing me bitch about being broke, cause you know, the divorce, like it just, yeah. Kills you, it, yeah. Kills you, kills you. And my husband had like pilfered money before we split up and I didn't know that until after we split up and I checked the bit, you know what I mean? So uh, he was like, do you want to work for me? And I'm like, well, what do you do? I assumed it was drugs, but I'm, I would, I'm picky about the type of drugs I'll sell. Like, I don't want to sell meth or any. I want to be part of the solution, you know, right, not the problem. Right, right. So um, he said he was a racker. And I was like, I don't know what that means. Are you a stock boy? And he was, and he told me, do you know what racking is? No. Oh, it's blatant theft from big box stores. You walk in, you fill out a car, and you just walk the fuck out. So that's what we did. And he, he just needed someone to distract the person in the department that he needed. Because he and the people that were in his crew, <laughs> crew, uh, they all specialized in different things. And so James didn't steal, like, cool shit, you know. It was not like TVs. James stole scrapbooking supplies from Hobby Lobby. <laughs> and then resold it on eBay. It's so, a fucking living, man. Right? It's a fucking living. Oh, no, he do. had a lot of money. And yeah, he had a no, great a house. Hustle. Absolutely. And uh, so I helped him out with that for a while. And one day we made a run from Kansas City to St. Louis and back and hit like all the Hobby Lobbies, all the Michaels, all the Joanne Fabrics and Crafts, you know. And we get back and he uh, dropped me off and he had to go do a pill deal because he, of course, he did also sell drugs. <laughs> and then a couple hours later, he called me and he was bragging about the pill deal. He's like, oh, I just did this big oxy deal. And I have all this money. He's like, uh, would you fuck me for 2,500 bucks? And I'm like absolutely yes absolutely i would and he was like kind of take he was like oh uh what like first of all how could you think i would say no 2500 dollars is that's good money you know for very little effort i was gonna fuck him for free you know if he was accurate to his pictures which he wasn't but so he was like well i don't i don't have it all in cash um well would you fuck me for 500 dollars?" and i was like yeah yeah i would my rent was like 455 dollars at the time of course I'm going to fuck you for $500. But then I was like, you know, then I had to ask about the details. I was like, well, no anal. And he's like, that's fine. You make the rules. And I was like, okay, I'm not sucking anything. And he's like, that's okay. You make the rules. I'm like, really? Is that okay? <laughs> okay. I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. How many times do I have to do it? And he was like, um, you, you tell me. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it one time. And he's like, no, 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 500. I want more. So I ended up doing it two times, but, and then he ended up f fucking me out of money over the the stealing stuff not i mean he paid me for the fucking he didn't pay me fully for the stealing and what he paid me for the fucking the 500 dollars he paid me for the fucking was the exact amount of money he he fucked me out of on the stealing the stealing right. yeah and then he blew town and went back to florida uh you know i don't know where else he would be from but <laughs> so 
I realized though, like it really made me think about that, think about sex for money and sex work and, you know, what was standing in the way of me doing that. Because I'd fucked like a ton of dudes for free, you know, and even bought like many guys enough drinks to like get them drunk enough, you know, and that's a terrible thing to do to someone, but that's, that's fine. Um, and so I, you know, I, I thought about that and I thought about like the, the morals and the ethics and I was never taught that sex was something like special. You know, I was never taught that it was like something that you have to, you really have to love the person and this is what two people who are in love do and you know, there's doves flying around and flowers are blooming. I was never, I was never taught that. And so after fucking so many guys that didn't give a shit about me for free, I, I just sort it just sort of dawned on me like, what am I doing? You know, I can, I can get laid and paid, you know? I can have the the dream. So I started doing stuff on Craigslist when I was in Kansas City. I was still living there and I started doing sex work on Craigslist and I would look for any ad that mentioned roses because that's dollars. And I would answer, like at first, when I first realized I was one of those people that could, you know, compartmentalize and, and, you know, separate like business fucking from pleasure sex, you know, I, I just was answering every ad every ad. I mean, ads I had no business answering shit. I had no idea how to do. I figured like, I was like, well, it's sex. Like, I'll figure it out. Um, and I didn't always figure it out. One time I broke a paddle on a guy's ass and he asked me to leave his house and then deducted the price of the paddle from what he paid me. Uh, but then I stopped. I don't remember why I stopped. I think maybe... No, no. So wait, never... guys will put out like what they want and what they're willing to pay for it on Craigslist? Yeah. Well, they won't say dollars though. They'll say roses. So you look under casual encounters and, uh, you know, you'll see like, oh, come watch me jerk off in a parking lot. I have 75 roses for you. Uh, one time I, I took a guy's virginity. Well, I thought I took a guy's virginity. It, afterwards, you know, my friend... I thought I took a guy's virginity and I did it really cheap because he was like, oh, I'm 23 and I'm just out of college and I can't afford to pay you much. And I was trying to be a really good person with it. I was trying to be sort of like, you know, I was trying to, I was trying to help people with my pussy. (laughs) So I was like, well, you know what? That's fine. I'll do it. And he's like, I can take you out to dinner on my dad's credit card. And it was so cute. And, uh, so after I did this, I called my friend, Justin, and I was bragging about what a good person I was. I was just like, I'm such a good person. This boy, I took his virginity. He was so sweet. I was nice to him. And Justin's like, you're stupid. And I'm like, no, I'm a good person. And he's like, how do you know he's a virgin? And I was like, well, because he said so. And then it just all sort of hit me. And then I, I, I stopped trying to, you know, be Mother Teresa about it and just stop trying to force the goodness. You've met some characters. Oh, yeah. You've seen the fucking dark side. I, I've definitely seen the dark side. You know, you dealt with people that are addicted to sex in a yeah. sort of way. When and, I was, I was, and I was addicted to coke. I was addicted to drugs. So yeah. when you're telling me these, I'm substituting these. It's all dr- the same thing. It's all thing. the same fucking thing. It's all the thing. same thing. It's but, all the you know, same that's the same thing. thing with day jobs. It's all the fucking same. If it's not what I want to do, you know, comedy, if I'm not paying my bills through comedy, through storytelling, through being on stage, then I don't give a fuck what I'm doing. You know, I don't care. I'm given a hand job, big deal. It's it's like less degrading to me than bringing some bitch like extra lemons for her water, you know? It's 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 all the same thing. Same addiction, same job, it's all the same I thing. I remember when I moved to Snowmass, I was 19 years old. I lived in Aspen, Colorado. And I used to work security at a hotel. And every fucking time somebody checked in, they could be a couple. And he would look at me weird. Like, mm-hmm. like, and then he would come back to the hallway and he'd go, hey, you know anybody? And I didn't know what he was talking I really did not know oh, what yeah. the fuck they were talking about. And then after a while, people says, hey, there's escorts.com and these guys are married. They got an extra fucking room. I was like, what wow. the fuck? <laughs> so you leave your wife in room 212 and go to 318 and fuck somebody else and then just walk yeah. out. But then I, I equaled it to drugs. Like mm-hmm. I would do, I would bust into somebody's door and take their fucking drugs in broad daylight without even thinking about it. Yeah. But the whole sexual thing has always been, I'm not good at it. 
I'm clunky. Not good at sex? No, I'm clunky. It just never worked out for me ever since I was a kid. A lot of people are. Yeah, I'm fucking bad. So it's like something that I've never lost my mind over. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I knew my mom raised me, and I knew that when she said something when I was a kid that I couldn't think about what she was saying. She goes, you can't fuck everybody. And I always, older, I said, you know what, there's girls you meet, you ask them out, they say no, most guys don't talk to them anymore. These guys are allies. Mm -hmm. So you become their friends, you know, and you have, it's so weird how I always looked at it. It was never a losing situation for me if I asked. But when I lived in, in, in Aspen, I remember walking around thinking to myself, I'm 19 years old. W what am I doing if I was a woman right now? No college education. Let's say I was a woman and I was banging. What the fuck would I be doing in Aspen? Mm -hmm. Working on a t-shirt store. Giggling. You can get these guys for a thousand a night. They're flying in. It's in their budget. They got the cash. Three, four nights a week. Four weeks, you know, three weeks a month. You got 12 grand. Yeah. That's 140 grand a fucking year or something like that. After five All years. All unclaimed. All unclaimed. After five years, you could buy a house, go to Beverly Hills, redo your pussy, and nobody mm -hmm. knows a fucking thing. Yeah. Nobody knows nothing. <laughs> Gone. You relocate to Massachusetts, and you live like Henry Hill the rest of your life. <laughs> and you got a house, you got a little bit of peace of mind as a woman. Right. No one knows your past. No one knows your past. You know, I always thought about it. I'm like, how do girls not do this? But then as you grow old, you know, you meet different women, you go, I get it, I don't get it, I get it. It's never been a big line with me. Like, I really don't give a fuck. It, to mm -hmm. me, it's like, you want to get naked, get naked. You know, I'm, I've always been one of those dudes. But when I was growing up in Jersey, we would go to the city to peep shows. Yeah. All right? And that always seemed the fucking lowest end of <laughs> yeah. death for me. Like, what I saw was crazy. Like, I used to go to the ones on 42nd Street, and they'd have the rotating table. Mm -hmm. And there'd be some chick with a cesarean scar, fucking doped up, and some junkie just fucking her. And you'd see the Hasidic Jews in the windows at 8 in the morning, like all fucking whacking off and shit. And you'd say, this is a complete different fucking world. Yeah. Like, this is crazy. And as soon as you open the door and you step out, a guy comes in with a bucket with water, hot water, and just mops yep. and goes out, and you step right the fuck in. Lease I had it was surreal, surreal. How many guys? How big that business is? And then they have the ones that the window opens, mm -hmm. and you can suck their tits and shit like that. And my friend Pat Paris Pizzione in the eighth grade mm -hmm. got his neck stuck. He didn't hear the ringer. <laughs> 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 he didn't hear the fucking ringer. And he got his head stuck in there in the eighth grade. Oh, that's hilarious. Have Have you ever done any porn or just just like the the dancing? Um, I, not really. I did this, I did this one thing. It was a Craigslist thing back in Kansas City. They were looking for women to read stories, read dirty stories topless. And it was like 250 bucks. And that was more than I'd gotten off Craigslist for a little while. And so I, uh, I was like, ah, no big deal. I'll do that. And, um, and I had some of the chest tattoos. So I bought makeup to try and cover them up so I'd be anonymous. And I didn't know anything about makeup or hair at the time. And I took um, my gay best friend with me as my security. And he brought this guy that he had just started dating. It was like their second date. And it was this hotel room. It was like a middle-aged couple, you know? Could have been anyone. They weren't like flashy. They weren't porny. They were just, they were just like middle-aged Midwestern couple. And they just uh, set it up and filmed me reading a story about um, my name was my name was Janessa from Denver, and it was a story about how I was a glory hole girl. And uh, they sent me a link to it after it was done, and I watched it once, and it was absolutely horrible, just terrible, horrible. But I figured. No one's probably gonna look at that, and if they do, they get what they, you know. Yeah, no, no. There's no. I have no judgment about it, but it's just that yeah. that's the one thing that I feel is like won't go away as much. Maybe like, and, and if you were a stripper, I think the emotional scars won't go away. You know, <laughs> if you have like, 
Yeah. He got well, into I, a I bad just run like, with it. I just meant like a, like with if you were gonna strip in like Wyoming sure. and try to hide out later in life, that's oh, possible. Yeah. With videos, it's kind of on the internet forever. I don't know. Now. I mean, I think that there's just so much porn out there. There's so many videos that I don't. I don't. I mean, I know that that's a concern for a lot of people, but I've never really cared about that. You know, I'll let feet guys. If I get foot customers, I'll let them take a picture of my feet after they're done with them. Uh, I mean, and I know feet aren't really a. Def- I have tattoos on my toes, so they're kind of a little more personalized, but. I just never really cared about it, you know? I just never figured that anything in, in like, such a huge sea of material, like, one person, like, who's going to stumble on your video? I know it's happened, but... Um. I just talked to a girl about a month and a half ago. She used to hang out at the Ha Ha Cafe. Mm-hmm. You know what, man? That whole time I knew I had no, no idea what she did mm-hmm. until she hit me up on Twitter one day. I was in Long Island. And she goes, I live here now. Can you leave me tickets? And then afterward, I didn't see her. So I didn't think she really showed up. And then she hit me a few days later. She thanked me. She said her aunt got drunk and they had to leave. So something happened. She called me. She uh, sent me her number for something. And we just toyed back and forth. And I finally was on the road one day. I go, let me call her now. And I called in the daytime. And that's when she told me her whole story. Mm-hmm. She goes, you didn't know what I was doing? I was a camera girl. Like the, oh, a webcam girl? Where you put the money in the camera, I guess. Yeah. And then she goes, but before that, I did porn. And she goes, but the cam stuff was, she was all cracked up and stuff. Because mm-hmm. when I met Meta, she was really skinny, so I couldn't tell what was going on. I knew something was not legit. It wasn't but a healthy to do with me. Yeah, it was yeah. hello, goodbye. That was a funny joke. Is that your dog? Shit like that. That was very light. So she was telling me that she went back to New York, gained the weight, went to a rehab, got a job in the restaurant as a waitress, and after six weeks, one of the guys in the restaurant said something to her. Oh. And she goes, it's been a hell of a sense for me at the restaurant. I go, well, you should just quit and get a job. She goes, it's not that easy. Yeah. She went, pays a car payment and a rent, and this restaurant pays well. It's a good clientele, so. But I think with the internet, it's just a matter of fucking time. Oh. You know? <clears throat> There's fucking crazy people out there, and that's one thing True. that Lee doesn't know but you know and I know. <laughs> I mean, just now when you said foot guys that just come in and just want to whack off on your feet. You know, they yeah. just want to do crazy shit. Yeah. You sit there. From my world, I think it's crazy. From their world, they think it's crazy. I wake up at 7 and smoke dope. Mm-hmm. You follow me? So, yeah, it's this, <laughs> there's all, like, who the fuck gets up at 7 and smokes pot in the morning? But I go somewhere and jerk off on some poor lady's feet or something like that. What do you charge a guy to whack off on your feet? Um, well, I mean, technically... I don't do that, right. of course, because I, I work uh, legally. They and give within you roses. All the, yeah, um, it would probably be, it would, you know, generally, if it's 200 roses or more, I'm negotiable for almost, almost anything, almost anything. Feet, guys, I have a soft spot for because the stripper shoes hurt and I do like a foot rub. So I will, uh, you know. Oh, I'll they'll give you a foot rub. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tremendous. Feet guys will give you a foot rub. They'll suck on your toes. They don't care how dirty they are. The dirtier, the better, usually. And so, you know, it's no big deal. You want to jerk off on my feet? You want me to give you a foot job? Like, I don't mind that. You're nice enough to rub my feet, even though that's what you're into. So, you know, really, you're, <laughs> you're just getting more than you paid for. But that's okay. I had a friend of mine, Roger, one time. I said, mm-hmm. you still get blowjobs from those chicks? He goes, nah, not anymore. I changed my act. They jerk me off with their feet. <laughs> I thought it was a joke. Obviously, no. it's true. I I first uh, discovered that when I was married, I would um, have my husband fuck my feet. Not I, we didn't like. He wasn't a foot guy. I wasn't a foot girl. But I just I wanted to feel like I was still being affectionate towards him. But I had already started hating him. So I figured that that was like the way to do it while still like keeping some distance between us. <laughs> my feet and it, but yeah it was nice like it feels like a nice uh like having a, a dick in the in the arch you know it feels like a it's a foot rub it's it's very nice you just talk to the Nike about that <laughs> like a fucking sneaker with a dick in the arch <laughs> Chinese people be jumping up and down and shit all day <laughs> now I mean you're the real fucking deal I didn't know yeah. this other side I just thought you danced in the glass protected yeah. nobody messed with your world <laughs> you know what I'm saying are you scared at times? I mean, I look at you and I can tell that you're tough and uh, 
You've been in some situations? Um, I've had, in the four years that I've worked at the at the private show place, I've had, uh, at Aero Station, I've had three customers the entire time that I was uncomfortable with. And one of them, I kept the heel of my shoe right here in the in his neck to keep him on the couch because he kept trying to get up and I kept saying, get the fuck down, sit the fuck down. And he just kept trying to get up. So I was I just put my foot there and I just let the timer run out. Um, and then there were two guys that were just creepy. They, they just had just a, I just, you know, really, really bad feeling. And not like they're gonna jump on me and rape me, but more like they, they would kill me. Like they would kill me in, in weird ways, just that sort of really weird energy. But um, I don't have a lot of fear of it. Uh, I, in 2014, I don't, this is kind of, this is gonna sound kind of ignorant, but I don't really care. Uh, in 2014, a guy broke into my apartment and assaulted me. Uh, I didn't know him. He wasn't a customer. It was nothing like that. It was just fucking, maybe not random. It was random that it was me. It was not random that it was that apartment. That apartment had problems before. That doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, I didn't fight back. I just yelled at him until he left. I was in shock. He woke me up with it. It was not, I didn't have time to really think about my reaction. And, um, so I didn't get to, to fight back. I didn't get to like, you know, I didn't get to fight. And I didn't, I, st I stayed away from work for like a week. And when I went back, I didn't know if I could do it. I went back and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to feel about these situations and being in the room, if I'm going to be like too nervous, if it's going to like traumatize me or re-traumatize or whatever. Um, but it, I actually felt stronger and I felt less nervous about saying no and setting boundaries and if the customer got upset big fucking deal you get upset fine no refunds you're upset big deal oh you want to do something about it good give me the chance you know give me the chance to fight back and that's the part that I think is ignorant because you know I feel like now like now I will I I think I could, I could fight any man. And I know in reality that's, you know, I'm 5'2", out of the shoes. It's not, it probably wouldn't work out very well, but it keeps me feeling, you know, maybe it's a false sense of security, but it's some sort of sense of security and that's enough, usually. No, 5'2"? Well, the shoes though. I mean, the shoes are <laughs> very, very, like, they're dangerous. They're very dangerous. You know, the heels of those things. Like I said, I put the heel in the guy's throat because I knew if he, I knew if he moved, you know, if he tried to come at me with the heel in his throat, terrible things would happen to him. So, I don't know, maybe I feel like I wear weapons on my feet. <laughs> and that gives me... It's fucking crazy that you yeah. do this and guys are alone with you. And even at the arrow, things, there's people there, there's guys there, there's cameras, there's got to no. be some security. Um, There's... The cashier who sits in the store up front, um, and you know you're never too far away from the other girl working. So, should you scream or should something bad happen, she would probably hear before the cashier. But something, I mean, like it wouldn't. I'm not worried about it. I don't. I feel very safe there. Most of our clientele have been there for years, and you know, I mean, we do get new guys, but. Usually they find out about the place from regular customers. So usually the guys that come in, even new ones sort of know the drill and they're 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 better behaved than um, many guys that I've just dated on the outside, like for free. No, you still date? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No steady? Um <laughs> uh, not not no. You no. Tell them what you Currently do. no. You tell them what you do. Yeah. They will just look at you and go. Oh, they go well, I mean, it hasn't it. been easy. No, uh, it's not easy. And there's some some guys think that because that's my job, then automatically we're not going to be monogamous. Because automatically, if I'm given some dude a hand job for work, they can go out and fuck some girl they meet at a bar. And clearly, it's the same thing. I don't feel that way. You know, 
And when I had a steady boyfriend, I did, I did back off of what I did. I I was a bit, a bit more chaste with it, you know. But mm, I don't know. Now you work a lot of hours. Yeah. You put in some fucking hours. You're a busy mm-hmm. girl. Yep. This place today, you're working eleven to one or something. Or 1 uh, to ten a.m. to one a.m. So I had a girl come in to cover um, the couple hours I'd be gone, and then I'd go back and stay there till 1 a.m. And it's busy the whole day? No. No, no, no. It's dead. I did one show today. I, I had one customer. We call them shows because that's what they technically are. How many days a week over there? Um, it depends. Usually I do four or five shifts. Um, this week I have, let's see, I worked yesterday, double today, so one, two, three. I work Friday day and Sunday day, so I'll do five shifts this week. And uh, it's it's we were closed for like three months because of licensing issues, so we just opened up. So not all of our regular customers know that we're open again. And so uh, it's been dead. Yeah, I mean it's always kind of dead, but it's been it's been pretty dead the past couple of weeks. I'm still good. I've got all sorts of water. Now you do comedy. Mm-hmm. How much comedy do you do? You go out a lot during the week. Do you get out? Um, you know, I worked the road pretty uh, steadily until I moved out to LA five years ago, and um, you know, I was featuring and can't really always afford to fly back to the Midwest or fly anywhere for feature money. It's so, a, it's a fucking yeah. nightmare. So I I just didn't really I didn't really realize that. I didn't realize that people didn't come to L.A. to work the road, that they came here to stay here and, and write shitty TV shows or good TV shows, you know, to write and to do movies. I, I just I thought that moving out here would help me on the road. I thought it would help me. You know, I read The Art of War and I thought that it, this was attacking the enemy from a different location. And. Uh, yeah, so. I I thought that I was coming out here to <coughs> to like really build up my career, and I came out here, and it really fucking killed it. So it's uh, a this is a different animal. Yeah, it's a different animal. You have to be prepared for it in a lot of ways. Um, you have to be at the right place at the right time, and you don't know what the fuck that is. Yeah, you never know what the fuck that is. You know, that's why I got into sex work out here because it was the only job I could find that would be flexible enough to allow me to travel. And when I did when I first moved out here I was traveling the first couple of years I was still on the road a bit but um, you know that's why I got into it out here it was the only thing I could find that would let me still do comedy um, so that's that's worked out well <laughs> I run a couple shows in town I mean and I do get up fairly regularly definitely usually at least a couple times a week so you bang it out you bang out the fucking comedy yeah you bang out the work, you travel. Yeah. Because you were just gone for 10 days. Yep, like I did the Fringe Festival in Kansas City. It was my 10th year doing it. And now, what's the Fringe Festival? Uh, it's just, well, it's like the one in Edinburgh. These are all, like all the domestic ones are just kind of offshoots of that one. So it's sort of a, a performing arts festival. The Kansas City one, I don't really know about a lot of the others. Kansas City has a visual arts component too and a film component as well. But um, it's primarily performance art. Um, a lot of a lot of shows and a lot of performers that wouldn't get into other festivals it's more accessible for them and there's a lot more experimental uh, performances so I've done in 10 years let's see I started doing it when I was a uh, performing when I was doing a lot of burlesque and then when I moved out here in 2011 I started doing I started I would go back for it and I would do solo shows and this one that I just did is my third was my third solo show and uh and i got my first uh standing up first two standing ovations in 20 years of doing comedy first two standing ovations good for you man yeah i didn't know what was happening the first one because i say i just go good night and i get off stage and i go backstage and they just kept clapping and i was back there and i'm like well they'll stop and then they didn't i was like what the fuck are they doing why aren't they stopping stop clapping and then my tech guy came back and he's like, you know, you're supposed to go back out there. And I'm like, why would I go back out there? The show's over. And he goes, well, they're standing up and they're clapping. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? It was something. Yeah, that was a. That what? was a real like changer. 
let me ask you this. Is there an end game? Is there one day you wake up and you go, I'm not going yeah. to that box anymore and dance and or whatever? Oh, yeah. Yeah, when I, when I don't have to. When I don't need to have that job to pay my bills? Absolutely. Absolutely. And now does the... Uh, is comedy still like that dream? Like when a guy like me comes in and <laughs> wants to fucking freak you out and you're like, wait a second, I have a dream. I'll put <laughs> up with this. <laughs> I have a dream, so... Is that still your dream to do comedy? You still feel it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Comedy, storytelling, absolutely. Like those are the solo shows that combine those two, and I really like. I really like that format. You know, I like not performing with so many limitations with comedy. Like if you're just in a mainstream comedy club, they have expectations. You're going to get up there within 30 seconds. You're going to have a laugh, which I never have a problem with. FYI, uh, but you know they. You want a premise, setup, punchline, premise, setup, punchline. They don't want a lot of deviation. And uh, with storytelling shows, they don't really want stand up. But if I do my own show, if it's a solo show, I can do whatever I want to do. And I. You can work, just go in and out. Yeah. You can and, just go in and out. Stand up, dance, mm -hmm. jump up and down, tell a story. Absolutely. And start all over again. So it's pretty innovative. I like that yeah. idea. Yeah. I work better when I don't have a lot of like. When I don't have limitations, I, I work better. I work better without like a lot of things imposed, rules imposed on me. I was raised to not really respect authority, and uh, and so I, I think that's I don't know. I think that's probably why I had problems with a few club owners. Do you ever talk about your uh, your sex work on stage? Because mm -hmm. I was thinking like it's amazing that more comics don't do that. Because like Joey, you had a life. Like a crazy life before stand up. Now, Julian, you yeah, it's a, a life that not a lot of people can relate. Like they can't, they can't even imagine. So it might, it'll be pretty cool. I would if like to talk about it. I talk about the stripping, and if I'm doing the storytelling, then I feel like it's easier to talk about the sex work to get more into it. But I think with just stand up, it would take so much time to explain what I do that. You know, any jokes that come from it, it's too much setup. It's too much setup required to. to well, for a comedy club, once you yeah. say fucking stripper, yeah, you lose the guys. That's oh. it. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're looking at you from a different perspective now. Yeah. Like now, now the women are like, "What the fuck?" Yeah. Well, so it's kind of weird. I can soften that because my jokes are really uh, the jokes about being a stripper are about how bad I was when I was at a strip club. I mean, I was terrible. I was just horrible. I'd done burlesque and I didn't think there was. I thought that was stripping, and it's so not. And I was just, I just was terrible. I was at his topless joint right up on Lankersham, um, Star Garden. And uh, this girl that hired me was someone I knew from burlesque. And so I just didn't realize there was, like, much of a difference. So I was up on stage wearing, like, fringed panties, and I was trying to do, like, glove peels. And these guys were just sitting there like, what are you doing? Just show us your tits and don't smile, you know? And, uh, yeah. So I think that because I'm coming at it from not a perspective of, like, I was a great stripper. I am a powerful stripper. I think because... But isn't that the, the truth with most comedy? Like, the underdog always, always is appreciated. You know, nobody wants to hear you talk about how great you are. Everyone wants to hear about, like, what you've overcome. I mean, in a funny way, of course. Everyone wants to hear about how the bad times, ah, but we can laugh at them, you know? Nobody wants to hear about how great your day went. Unless it went great for a really weird reason, you know? Nobody wants to hear about the day you, you checked off everything on your to-do list. You know, well, I went to the post office today, everything went fine. I went to the grocery store, everything was fine. Picked up the kids, they were a treat. Nobody, that's not funny, you know? If your to-do list includes, like, I fucking I ended up in Mexico trying to buy pills and everything went fine and everything went great that's different but nobody wants to hear about benign bullshit I don't think now you do spots at the improv and stuff I mm -hmm. know that right one of my shows is at the improv and you can what, what's the show at the improv it's called be funny it's a stand up spelling bee okay I'm a really good speller I'm a stripper then, that can spell really well and then what is the other show you do uh, the other one is called Dirty Birdie Story Hour and it's a storytelling show themed around deviance not just sexual but any kind of deviance and that's at three clubs in Hollywood second oh, Monday oh shit mm -hmm. anytime you would so grace you, my you, stage you, you, you know. hit it from all fucking angles don't you yeah that's tremendous yeah. man 
And I'm starting another show, actually, um, on my birthday, August 22nd, and it's, uh, it's a brand new concept. I don't think anyone has ever done it. It's not stand-up. It's not storytelling. It's, it's something else. What is it? Conversations. It's called We Need to Talk, and it's uh, a celebration of the lost art of conversation because I'm tired of not talking to people. I'm tired of just looking at my phone or texting people. I went... I went to, on like a pre-date with a guy that I was really, really into and we texted and I'm really great at texting. I'm really great at it. I was witty. I was charming. Awesome. And then I went to hang out with him and I mean, I'll granted I was, was pretty high, um, but he was too. And we were sitting on opposite couches and it just felt like a job interview and I couldn't just, I couldn't have like a natural conversation with this person. And I just, I hate that. I want to be able to have conversations again. And I think that everyone should have conversations again. Get out of the phone, you know, just face out of the phone and talk to a person. So that's, uh, that's what I'm doing. It's a show comprised of 10 five minute conversations with me, um, seven booked, three audience members. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Try it. You never, listen, man, at least you're working from, you know what you want to do. A lot of comics come out here and. You made some great points tonight with the conventional comedy. Like mm-hmm. when you go to a comedy club, they don't want to fuck around. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You could, you could fuck around in the middle, but they want you to grab them. They want you to sell drinks. They yeah. want you to do a thousand things. So it's the business side of it. Yesterday I was sitting there. It's funny how I learned to become a comic at the comedy store, but I learned the comedy business at the improv. Mm-hmm. It's so weird what I grabbed from both <laughs> those clubs. You know, yeah. and the improv, they're great because they're open to ideas. You go up to the improv and go, I want to do this show. And yeah. go, okay, we'll give it a shot for three weeks and we get people talk about other things, you know. But like, I'm done. Like, people come to me all the time and go, I have a new idea and I want you to do it. What is it? It's a stand up show for TV. I don't think people want to watch that anymore. You have the show on fucking whatever, mm-hmm. you have Comedy Central, and you have HBO, and you have Showtime. You know, what kind of show are you going to do? I was always looking for a show like what you're saying. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe half storytelling, 10 minutes of comedy with a panel. I don't fucking know. Yeah. But it's 2017. It's time to mix it up a little bit, you know? Yeah. I don't have the balls. Like, I've always spoken to Lita Traveling with the podcast. And I just don't have the balls and I don't have the time. I don't have the time to travel with the podcast. Because you know? you're busy traveling for comedy and doing comedy yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm doing and comedy stuff. So, and I'm burnt out. I'm an old fucking man. It takes a lot out of you to fly. This last week I flew and I don't feel too fucking good. I really? got to Denver tomorrow. Well, I mean, please feel free to pass any gigs that you are too tired to do. No, 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 no. To, uh, I, no, no. What a I do is, well, stripper. What I usually <laughs> do is, listen, I know my situation. Yeah. So I book light. Mm-hmm. I know what I can do and I know what I can't do. Yeah. You know, I know. I know already. So ask me, and I'll tell you. And I, I know what I can do, and I know what I can't do. You know, I have a family, so I got to be there between four and seven, four and seven thirty. So I just have all these little restrictions on me now. Not to mention, when I go to the comedy store, I get home at twelve fucking forty-five. Yeah. That means I fall asleep at two. That means I'm behind the fucking eight ball. So that's the other thing that I'm thinking about lately, like just doing comedy on the road. And just staying in during the week and doing the fucking podcast. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's so weird. Lee and I, before you came, we're talking about the process. And part of the process is obstacles that get thrown at you, and you have to fucking go around them to yeah. continue your life, to make your life run smooth, you know? And mm-hmm. who the fuck knew I was going to have a fucking baby at 50, you know? Who the fuck knew the podcast was going to make people come to comedy shows? Yeah. Who the fuck knew? I didn't know. But you talk, you do something, you stick to it, they feel your belief. And next thing you know, the wheels are in fucking motion. You know, Lee, when we started this podcast in that fucking office before the baby was born, did you think we'd have an office down here five years later? Not and the process has been tremendous. What was part? Of, what was the whole fucking process? We just stuck with it. We didn't do nothing that nobody else didn't fucking do. And I think I just answered my own inner turmoil. I was just about to say, like, I didn't think about it. I didn't really... I was just having fun doing the podcast. I really never thought about five years down the road I and that's weird for me because that's usually what I obsess about yeah so yeah oh yeah um, I I didn't think about 
like things like like business things or where things were going when I was first doing comedy, and I really burned a lot of bridges that I was never able to rebuild. Well, so did I. Yeah. So did I. I didn't think I was going to get this far. I didn't think I was going to stick with it. So I didn't really give a fuck. I didn't really give a fuck. You know, I thought about it from a comedian's. At first, you know, we're all our noses open, mm-hmm. and we want to take every gig. But then one day you talk to a friend of yours, and he's like, don't do that fucking gig. Yeah. That guy's a thief or whatever. And then you start saying no. You start making little fucking moves, you know. I, I, I fucked over. I remember I wouldn't send the tape. Mm-hmm. Like, I just refused to send the tape. I ain't sending your fucking tape, all right? You, look, who's your feature this week? Susanna? At, get, get her on the fucking hotel phone right now. We yeah. worked two weeks ago. What the fuck tape? You're not going to look at the fucking tape. I've never it's gotten anything control. off the tape. No, so that's why yeah. I never sent the tape. I, I refused to. I refused to. Mm-hmm. Know. And you know what's funny? I got three jobs from blank tapes. <laughs> because they don't look at the tapes. It's just a control tactic. Yeah. And I've told young comics before. It's just, now it's completely different because now you're on YouTube. Yeah. Now they just go on YouTube and they fucking find you and you're dead. Mm-hmm. You know, so right there is they're talking to you. Right there is they're talking to you. Uh-huh. And what do you do? I'm a feature. Okay. They put an earbud on and they're talking to you. Yeah, okay. And they see if you're dirty or not and shit. Right? They're like, okay. Uh, email me your avails in three weeks and I'll let you know what's going on. Whatever. But there were just things I thought were just power moves. That I didn't fucking like and I didn't appreciate. Yeah. You know, you and I are the same animal in a lot of yeah. ways. I'm sitting here looking at you going, we're the same animal in a lot of ways. Um, the only problem with me is I'm half a prude. <laughs> like I'm a half a fucking prude. That probably man. makes it even better. <laughs> Just the fact that she could like make you blush. Oh no, she she knows it. That I'm like a, my fucking uh, you know I'm like a half a fucking prude. So I could have gone the other way. I just wouldn't know what service I could have offered. You know what I'm <laughs> I couldn't offer no fucking services to no women. I'm clunky and shit. Are there guys that do that? Fuck yeah. yeah. To, for women? Yeah. Fuck yeah. The American Gigolo and mm-hmm. shit. Richard Gear, eighty one. Stop it. Going over to Freak's houses right over in Belly Hills, getting three grand a pop, like yeah. silk shirts and shit, Lisa. Yeah. We'll make you one of those motherfuckers down there in Belly Hills, <laughs> going down there and slinging dick down there. And some, <laughs> some little, you gotta give him a back rub first, Lee. You know that? Yeah. My mind is, I just never imagined a girl would want that. Well, <sighs> like a lot of, you know, best case scenario, high powered, rich women don't want the bullshit of dating, so they're like, okay, I need a someone to go with me to this event let me find someone real pretty yeah that's and then he's gonna fuck me afterwards because i'm gonna pay him enough money (laughs) you know and i I don't well i don't want to say anything go go what the fuck i think a lot of those a lot of the um gigolos are gay or gay men um why just so they don't have any like emotional feeling for it or like i don't i don't know if that's the reason i don't know if it's like I don't know. I mean, I'm, I know there's straight men that do it too, but I don't know if, if they get like overly excited, like like a little dog just jumping up, like oh oh I get to fuck you for money, oh yay! You know, I don't know if it's that or if it's if it's just I'm not really sure because I've never really uh, it's not that's not my bag. Yeah, you know? I was gonna say that like I would like to pretend that that w- wouldn't be me, but if anyone offered me that, that would be. I think I might why just pass out. Oh, on, yeah. Why don't we put you on fucking the magazine show then? Craigslist. Craigslist cute little Jew would come over your house and holocaust your pussy. You know <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous. With a picture of Hitler on it. Forget about it. You'll be getting 10 fucking calls an hour. Susanna Absolutely. Lee will be making 10% off you making fucking a Perfect. G a day. That's it right there. That's great. Hey, listen, I Ron just found Je- my out. Listen, Ron mm-hmm. Jeremy no- has never won a fucking Mr. America contest. <laughs> no. And he made millions of dollars fucking fucking women. You yeah, but I don't me? have Ron Jeremy's dick. Who, who knows? Maybe you got mm-hmm. something, a different pizzazz. Maybe you got the ass of a star. Maybe women will love your legs. They'll say you got legs like Elvis. They love the hair on your legs and shit like that. You never know, Lee. You got to give it a shot. There's a fetish category for for whatever you are. You Whoever show- you are, whatever you have, there's Dog, someone listen, that wants to watch it. you show up dressed up. Well, who play? What's Sean Penn? What's that character he played in? Uh, you show up dressed like Kleinfeld, the fucking attorney Jew, and fucking uh, what's that movie? Carlino's Way, remember? No, I didn't see that one. See, this is why I, I can't talk to you no more. This is why I can't <laughs> talk to you. One of Sean Penn's greatest performances. You never fucking saw it. Because <laughs> yeah, you just say you could come over dressed as a as a as a seed. You come over dressed as a judge. 
an attorney. You could be a thousand different fucking characters, Lee. Little rim glasses. I got ideas now. 10% goes to Uncle Joey. I can pimp you out down in Beverly Hills, Culver City and shit, Brettwood areas. I'm down. <sighs> Let's do it. That's crazy. Now, the other job you had behind the glass, I yeah. can't touch you there, correct? Um, there's lap dances there as well. At the other place? Yeah. Where I went like, to there? Mm-hmm, peep shows and lap dances. And so, technically, no, you can't touch. But, you know, lap dances are lap dances. And right. if you tip, you know, they're better lap dances. I thought you just did the, the, the boot thing that was in over there. That oh, was always yeah. very interesting to me. I thought about you and I said, you know what, man? I gotta talk to her why I have this fear of all this sex shit. Like, it just makes me go fuck. Like, I feel fucked up when I walk into those places. Well, I mean, they're kind of fucked up places. Like, that that place is dirty. Dirty place. Yeah, but I've never gone to one of those places that ain't dirty. That's what gives right. it a certain Exactly. Possession. That's the poetry of it. Listen, That's I what I loved to, about it. I went it. to a place one time that I don't know if people have PTSD or people had trauma, but I gotta tell you something. That night fucked me up for a couple of years because I saw some weird shit that night. In the early 80s, New York City was a fucking... Oh, yeah. You know, just a king of that shit. When I was in the fucking seventh grade, I had these two brothers, Juan and Alberto Ali. One was legit. The other one got hit in the head with a rock. In fact, one day, I hit him in the head with a fucking rock. I threw it up in the air, and he looked up, and I hit him right here. And he had a lump with a fucking cyst in the middle. <sighs> but we used to hit each other with uh, light bulbs from Durotest. Uh-huh. Like the long ones and little ones. Because they would always have uh, dysfunctional fucking light bulbs. And they just throw them in the dumps. Anyway, to make a long story short, these kids were in the fucking eighth grade. So said, maybe 13. Alberto was stupid. So he was maybe 15, but he was still in the eighth grade. Mm-hmm. They were in two different <laughs> classes. They came from Cuba, so they didn't know how to speak English. So until you learned, they just kept you in the seventh grade. And then when you got to the seventh grade and be 16 or driving, they put you in a program called the pilot program. Then you went into high school as a sophomore. So it was kind of weird. But anyway, to make a long story short, I remember being in the seventh and eighth grade with Alberto and Juan, and they would come to school on Monday and break down how they would take a bus to the Bronx and go to a place and they'd take you to a place and you pick the girl and my heart would stop as they were telling me the stories how the chick would wash your dick and then you would, she would fuck you ask you what you wanted and it was like cheap I would sit there and go what, what the fuck are you talking about and I never thought about it in my perverted mind and years later I went out with these guys one night the kid had a candy truck and they took me over to this place called the 1040 Club mm-hmm. and it was nine ninety nine plus tax 10 fucking 40 it's 1982, 10.40. Oh. And I don't remember if you paid when you were back there. I don't remember if you paid extra when you were back there. But they threw you into a lounge. All these guys were cologne on. They were looking to score all night. Like mm-hmm. those guys come in like at one in the morning. Now they can't score, so they want to get some pussy. Yeah. And I'll never forget asking, like, Pablo, you can want it. It was one. I go, you come here a lot. And he's like... Yeah, I come here all the time. It's great. The girls are great. They were from another country. They didn't fucking speak the language. They were scared mm-hmm. to be there. And they were fucking Susanna in cubicles. Yeah. Like, there was no room, Jack. Yeah. It was office cubicles. And you would just go into the office cubicle, and there was just a wall. And she would take a bucket out from the under the bed and pour water on it. And then have a sponge, and she'd wash your dick. Let me explain something to you. I had never experienced anxiety until this woman started washing <laughs> my dick with this fucking sponge. And then she asked me what I wanted to do. I couldn't even talk, Susanna. I was like, oh, I couldn't even talk. So I just laid down. She got on top of me and she started bouncing and I couldn't stop. Like thinking of all the shit that was going to happen to me. Like I just couldn't stop. Like and the bed kept going. Quack, quack, quack. It was one of those beds that you just opened up. Uh-huh. And there was a thin mattress in the middle that had been used for years. Oh, yeah. And she's on top of me. I don't know what to do. So I couldn't come. I couldn't react. I just lay there in the middle. After two minutes, she just stops. And she goes, you know, for an extra $10, you're going to eat my pussy. And I remember, like, I just threw her off me. And I just put my pants on and ran out of there. <laughs> and that was it for me. That was it. Like, that was it for me. 
Was it the impersonal nature of it? Or the fact that it was reduced to such a business endeavor? Both. Mm -hmm. Both. Both. It was just fucking horrific. I couldn't believe guys were in there. Like, it just fucking killed me. And then, you know, I was a half a fag. I had regular girlfriends and shit. I didn't really know mm -hmm. nothing about nothing. And then when I got into comedy in 91, I got divorced, and I started doing comedy, and I started meeting people on the road. And I met this one girl that just took me for the ride of my life. Mm -hmm. I still talk to her. I still <laughs> talk to her. She's crazy. She's got two kids now. She married an Indian dude that was 80, and he died and left the three million. All oh, this chick oh. had, oh, yeah. But she still strips. Mm -hmm. once a week in the town over. So I think she lives like in Sarasota. She strips uh -huh. in Tampa. Oh. And she's got a living boyfriend. He doesn't know it. She, she's just a fucking animal. You know, she's yeah. just a real deal. You can't even contain that shit with the animalistic <laughs> shit in her heart. But I got to tell you something. At that time, I had been to prison. I had done a thousand things. She was telling me shit that I was like my jaw would draw. Mm-hmm. Like, she was telling me stories of her going to college and some guy was paying her rent and fuck her once a week. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Sugar daddy. Yeah, he'd just come over, fuck her, and leave. He didn't care what she did, nothing. If she had to take a trip somewhere, she would go with him and he'd give an extra 3000 fucking dollars. It was just, I didn't know about this world. <laughs> I swear to God, I had no idea about this world, man. It was fucking crazy to me. So... Uh, I ended up dating her for like four years, and it was just, it was just an experience going to pick her up at the strip club, mm -hmm. like you know, and then driving home. But I just felt fucking, uh, and it was weird because a friend of mine always says that one day I got really funny. When her and I broke up, mm -hmm. everything in my life changed because it seemed like me being with her was holding me back, like something was fucking with me, and it was. It mm -hmm. really was fucking with me. You know, she was on a strip club. She was hustling. I knew what she was fucking doing. I'm not fucking retarded. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You can't bullshit the bullshit. I know what you're <laughs> fucking doing. So it just, it's, it's weird. Today I still talk to her because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have been in L.A. So I don't forget anybody. Oh. Yeah, that's the truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. She was the one that said, let's go to fucking L.A. Let's give it a shot. You know, so oh. I can't uh, put it down for any reason. It was sure. her balls that got me here, so. Let me give some shout outs and I'll get you the fuck out of here. Where's my glasses? I'm going old. Don't forget Denver this weekend and next Friday, the Ice House. Dylan Bailey, Beloy, John Cutler, and Amy, Margaret Oliver, Crystal Oaks, Davin Cole Jr., Brett Rogers, Joey Rookland making it happen, Randy Hill, Joshua Mancuso, Mancuso, and Greg and Lynn up there in Seattle. I owe you a call, Greg. I didn't forget about you, cocksucker. And that's it. I got to go to Denver this weekend, man. And I got to tell you something. That in hairs, I think that's what fucked me, got me sick this week. Just the thought of going to Denver. The hairs of my necks have been sticking up. You know, I have a 26-year-old daughter. No. And she lives in, I'm sure she doesn't live in Boulder. Mm. But my ex lives in Boulder. We haven't talked. We just don't talk. Mm -hmm. So every time I go work Denver... I just feel shitty for a few minutes when I go to Denver, you know? Yeah. I lived in Denver in that area for a long time. And it's a real beautiful city. And I always felt like I disrespected. I got arrested in, what is this, a fucking rocket ship? <laughs> it's like the fucking Twilight Zone. You know, I always felt like I disrespected it. Like I got arrested there. I went to prison in fucking Boulder. Oh, wow. Yeah, I got caught for kidnapping in Boulder and shit. Yeah, oh. I, yeah <laughs> it, was a, it was a fine day. <laughs> so, uh, the crazy thing is that now I'm, I've always been ashamed of going back to Colorado. Like, I've always been a, mm -hmm. The mountains are beautiful. I disrespected the mountains. You know, I thought this oh, way yeah. for years. So for years, I was banned from this club in Denver. That's what made me leave Denver, getting banned from the Comedy Works. Oh, yeah. You follow me? So when, once, yeah. once I got banned from the Comedy Works, I was like, what the fuck am I going to do in Boulder? Work McKelvey's? Mm -hmm. Wits End? When am I going to do that? Yeah. Die to death. Die. <laughs> So I had my daughter, who was five at the time, and I just talked to the mom and said, I got to move to L.A., and then we kept the relationship cool for a few years, but then it just went sour when she was like 10 or 11. They went to England for two years. And oh. just, so, so the daughter doesn't talk to you? No, oh, we don't talk at all. I've tried. You know, I've made an effort, but what are you going to do? So 
Every time I go back there, just uh, it's just a weird feeling that you get, you get like your little neck hair stick up and shit. It's fine. I go back there, I do my comedy, I get some green chili, I go for a walk in the high altitude, and I get to see. Uh, this is the first club I ever got on stage at June eighteenth, nineteen ninety one. This is oh, the wow. first fucking club that I ever got on stage on. So it's always great. To, when I got banned from there, it was pretty. It's really weird. Lee and I, before you showed up, we're talking about the process of your life. Mm-hmm. And the things that happen, what happens to your mind, like you think you're dead. And you're really not ever dead till you're dead. You're not dead till they put you in the fucking casket. You're not dead till you're fucking dead, man. Yeah. Because I thought I was banned from the fucking comedy works. Like people would say to me, her, hey, I want to bring Joey Diaz to feature. And she'd go, not in a million years. He's banned for life. And I bumped into her in Denver at the Oddball Tour. And she goes, are you mad at me? And I go, why would I be mad at you? Because of you. I did something with my life. You forced me to do something. You pushed a hand. I had to come out of here and leave and move to Seattle and start from scratch. So now I'm working for her again. After that, she called my agent. She goes, we had a talk. I want to book him at my fucking club. So everything, you know, this is where I started. So this is like kind of uh, emotional when I go back there. I get that. Know? I got no ties. I got no warrants, not like that, you know, mm-hmm. everything's cool, I just uh, go back there and relax and do comedy and eat chili, I'm looking fucking forward to it, man, I really am, I'm looking forward to this weekend, it's one of those weekends, this is one of the best clubs in the country, have you ever stepped foot in there? No, I talked to her on the phone once in the 90s. Yeah, the comedy works yeah. downtown, that's uh, a, yeah. it's been there a long time, it's been there for sure for 25 years, because that's when I stepped on the fucking stage, and it was probably there 15 years before that. Mm-hmm. So they have another one now, that's in a more suburbia, I would make That's it. the improv, right? Or no, the Comedy improv. Works has two locations? Comedy there? Works has two locations oh. and then the Improv. The Improv is a nice club. I worked that one first. Before I worked at Comedy Works, I worked the Improv. Yeah. Nice place. I was going into Denver for a burlesque fest, and uh, I saw Al Canal in the airport who was managing the Improv at the time, and I hadn't seen Al uh, for years. Al, you know, quote-unquote managed me for like a few minutes, real few minutes. Um, and, uh, yeah, he said it was a nice place, and... Um, such a great guy. Yeah. I think he's back in Missouri now. Listen, man, I'm happy you came in here. Thank you so much you. for having me. I didn't think me. you'd uh, open up as much as you did. It was very interesting. I'm an uh, open book. No, I know. Now, what's the name of the documentary you did with Felicia? Um, Felicia's documentary is called Perv. Perv. And the web series that uh, I created was called Peeping Comics. And, um, yeah, it should be very interesting. Now, before, now what's a pedophile? A pedophile is somebody who molests kids? <laughs> yes, yeah, so, well, someone who is attracted to children. Someone who is sexually attracted to children. You know, whether they act on it or not, you know, the urges are... Well, before you said pedophile, and I, and I try to put two and two together, if they're in there giving you a foot rub, they're not pedophiles. No. But maybe. <laughs> maybe they're pedophiles in Pe- training, working themselves it? backwards and shit. <laughs> Pod- and it's a podof- podophile, right? Podiatry is foot doctoring, so it wouldn't pod. Listen, man, let me tell you something. <laughs> it's an let me tell you something. Right. It's I love a woman's foot in a shoe. Mm-hmm. I really love a woman's foot in a shoe. When I see a woman's ugly foot and she's got it in the wrong fucking shoe, it pisses me the fuck <laughs> off. You understand me? Yeah. When they got a long foot and they put them in the long in the launch pad shoes, yeah. and they have a twist around their ankle, don't do that. Mm-hmm. Makes your foot look fucking long. Now. Don't do that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's different yeah. shoes. I always, I love women's shoes. But I got to tell you something. I would never suck a woman's toe. Never? Not even mm-hmm. if it's super, super clean? Fuck no. No? Fuck no. I no, would... no, 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 no. I wish I could do a replay because when she was saying that, I switched the, to your camera because you, your eyes were just shut. <laughs> 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 you were just so sad. Oh, yeah. Fuck no. I don't know that I would suck a guy's toes. Oh, no. And I don't, I generally, unless the money is really, really good, I do not go near man ass. Or if I'm in love. Uh, if I'm in love, I'll, I'll put a finger in the ass. But men's asses, no. No, they just I had too many bad experiences yeah, yeah, with yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Your finger fucking stinks for two <laughs> fucking weeks yeah. and shit. Then you, got, you can't sneeze. You nail brush. And, yeah, you gotta get the nail brush. No, no, no. I, I know it's one. in my ass. I wouldn't let you go in there. <laughs> it's fucking disgusting. It's because you're a gentleman. You're a gentleman and a scholar. No, you, know? you have to bathe if you gotta go into those <laughs> fucking places and shit. <laughs> you can't go in there all fucking stink. You gotta go home and put some cologne on or whatever the fuck <laughs> you got. I don't wear cologne, but personally, whatever the fuck it. 
it's just uh, I like you. I, I like, like you. you. I think that uh, you're interesting as fuck. I think you're out the box. Thank completely you. Completely different than the rest of the broads you talked to in L.A. They're all uh, cut from the same cookie. They're all chasing the same nickel. Yeah. It's nice to know you're not chasing the same nickel. You know, uh, we have a time right now in this country where we're about to get the Lilith Fair. You know, I mean, and I can't blame him. I mean, uh, Trump's fucking retarded. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they give you, I mean, he just talked his way out of this fucking thing. Whatever Absolutely. And uh, we have this Lilith Fair, you know, and you see all these women with women power and stuff. And I think real woman power is when I see a woman like you. Thank you. When I see a woman that uh, is living life under her fucking terms. It scares the shit out of me, you know. And now, now, I'm, now I got to add you to my life. I got to think about your three in the morning that you make at home tonight. <laughs> that some guy tried to bite her fucking toe off. <laughs> but you... Uh, I'll always make it home, don't worry. You go to Starbucks and you see these women who think they're uh, they're doing something. They went and watched that fucking stupid movie. You know, uh, what's the movie when she went over to Saigon to eat the hummus? What's that movie with the chick from Saturday Night Live? Oh, oh, the, the, uh, yeah, what's the three one? words. Yeah. You pray love? No, the other one. No. That's the other one. This is the one that oh, came. Oh, I thought it was that one. No, that's the one with the uh, Julie Pretty Roberts. Woman. Right, the one that came out with the chick from Santa Ana Lime that she get, breaks up with the guy and she goes over to fucking Iran and she meets Turkish oh. people and shit like that. You know, you see those women and they're sitting there at a fucking Starbucks talking about their adventures in fucking Bangladesh and shit and three other women like sitting there drooling from themselves. And then again, I see a woman like you who's banging it out, the real deal, banging it out, doing comedy, you know, listening to fucking perverts and shit, which at the end of the day, you don't listen to. When you do comedy as a woman, mm -hmm. every fucking night, you get abused. Yeah. Every fucking night. Somebody says, night's tits, you got a nice ass. You know, uh, you open up the fucking stripper gate on these fucking morons. Yeah. yeah. It's a fucking nightmare as a woman. Trust yeah. me, I was on the other side of that, so I know how creepy we get at times. Yeah. But, you know... Uh, on it's the just road, just I've been treated worse by the men in, in the comedy industry than I've ever been treated by the guys that I've stripped for or done whatever for, you know? I've, I, had a, I had a club owner ask me to blow his landlord between shows on a Friday once. It was right after the only, the only time I ever got fired from a club, and so when he asked me to come in the office, I was like, oh, shit, I'm going to get fired again. Oh, no, because I thought it was just a snowball thing. And I went, and he goes, my landlord is at the show, and I was like, I'm really going to get fired. And he goes, and he liked you. And then I was like, I don't know what's happening now. And he goes, would you blow him? And he must have seen my face, like, just fall or do something. Because he goes, oh, no, 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 I would pay you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Did I didn't, you negotiate or you no, said no, no? No, no, I was just like, no, no. That's good that you keep him. I was like 23 at the time. Yeah, I was you like, keep him uh, separated. Well, this was before any of that. This was. Yeah, because once you get one blowjob on the road. You'll never stop. I, they don't, don't, don't fucking have to tell hunt me, you down you know? like a fucking barracuda, <laughs> these motherfuckers. Uh, Lee, what do you got going on, cock licker? Uh, what do I got going on? I have a couple more podcasts this week. and uh, Paula comes back Sunday. She it's comes back over. Sunday from Rome. You're locking her up Sunday night. It's over and shit. Yeah, she's in Rome with Henry, actually. Henry's there. Oh, my God. Henry who? Because Our buddy from Jiu-Jitsu. Henry? Yeah. Who's Henry? Henry Hulahan. Yeah, okay. for, no Henry. Uh, yeah, human. Yeah. Hold on. Okay, nice, nice. All right. And that's it. That's a. Uh, I'm happy you. I'm trying to think of what else I have. No, that's it. Yeah. That's all you got. Don't worry about. It. I gotta go to Denver. I'll be back Sunday. Next week we're on. We're on Monday, and Wednesday next week. I want to thank Susanna Lee. Right. Yes. Thank you for coming on the show tonight. I also want to thank our sponsors. Number one, as usual, on it. I love you, motherfuckers. I've been doing the mixed greens lately, and it's tremendous. I've been taking the shroom tech again. It's tremendous. I've been back on the uh, hemp force protein again. You know, I got a box every, like, three months. I bother them, and I get reacquainted with the products and shit like that. And I got to tell you, it's better than fucking ever. The shroom tech, I'm, I ate. I got my blue belt. Something must have happened. So you have that there. Number two, speaking about blue belts, geese, rash guards, bags, gee bags, they have one of the best, you know how I always talk about preparation? Absolutely. Nobody like Datsusara put together a bag for jiu-jitsu that's more prepared. I got knee pads in there. I got knee pads for the knee pads. I got an extra belt. 
I got an extra rash guard in there. I got a water bottle, and I got a backup water bottle canteen, so the water stays at the fucking temperature. You, put it in you understand me? <laughs> there ain't no fucking dicking around when I finish class. Now the water's warm. I got four packages. I got an extra zipper down there that I can hide my little protein powders down there. They even give you a little bag to put your rash guard in so the wet rash guard doesn't touch your fucking gi. This is the technology of Datsusara, okay? And all the products are made with hemp, whether it's their tremendous gis, whether it's their tremendous rash guards, or the famous fanny pack, as we call it. I got mine ready for tomorrow. Vapor pen, papers, aspirin for the heart. You know, the whole <laughs> fucking deal. You understand me? Some uh, gummy bears. I got everything ready to go to Denver. So that's what I'm talking about. Fanny pack, rash guards, the ghee, the hemp ghee is superb. I dropped 20 pounds. I'm in that motherfucker doing sidekicks into flying arm bars. You understand me? But do me a favor. Go to uh, dsgear.com. And go to the page. Take a look at the colors they have. Take a look at the supplies they have, whether it's the bag that you're looking for or a new ghee or a new rash guard. Take a look at the fine selection. And then... What do you do, Lee? You use code Joey, and you're going to get 5% off. 5% off, delivered to your house, dsgear.com. Right or wrong? Absolutely right. Okay. I got to give you a rash guard, Lee. You look nice in a fucking rash guard, Cox. I got a little hemp rash guard for you. All, all jokes aside, if you're looking for a great travel bag, jiu-jitsu bag, Datsusara, look at that one I have. It's fucking phenomenal. I'll take a picture next time I go to jiu-jitsu. I love you, cocksuckers. Thank you for coming on. My little princess, thank you for coming on. I want to thank Anit. I want to thank Datsu Sara. And I want to thank all you motherfuckers for listening and giving me your time. Have a great weekend. Be safe, and we'll be back Monday. Stay black. <laughs>